Morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for today's aviation simulation webinar. Uh, today, we will be exploring the topic of immersive simulation training for wildland fire aviation in the United States, past, present, and future. Uh, my name is Assistant Commissioner Ben Millington from the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, and I'm delighted to be your host again today. Before we start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that I'm hosting this event uh, from the lands of the Wongal people. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all join us from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in today's events. I also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land and the waters across Australia. Before we get into the presentations uh, and introduce our guest speakers, I'd like to just provide you with some brief housekeeping uh, notes. Uh, today's event will be recorded and made available after the event. Uh, we'll also be using the Q&A feature on the Zoom to take questions. So please post any questions in the Q&A box and not the chat window. Um, you'll be able to upvote questions by clicking thumbs up button. And I'll do my best to ask a number of these questions to our speakers following their respective presentations. I also encourage you to use the chat window to share any thoughts or reflections during the presentation. And just a reminder that you'll need to select all panelists and all attendees in the drop down menu for everyone attending today to view your messages. I'd also like to remind you to please be respectful to each other and our presenters when posting your comments and questions and I'm sure you will be. So uh, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming our guest speakers uh, for today's session. Uh, we have four very well experienced and well known aviation specialists joining us today. Uh, the first being Mr. Ryan Becker from the US Forest Service Air Tanker Performance uh, Specialist. He's also an aerial intelligence and imagery and payload integrator. Uh, Mr. Trevor Maynard from the US Forest Service uh, he's a wildland fire project leader, as well as a structural fire researcher, section chief, investigator, and instructor. Uh, Mr. Joel Lane uh, has had 43 years in wildland fire, 23 years instructing aerial firefighting, and has also been involved in real-time intelligence program design and coordination. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Kenneth Perry, who has also spent considerable time in the wildland fire industry, 35 years in fact, uh, 21 years as an aerial supervisor and a well-experienced simulator supervisor and coordinator. So on behalf of the group, welcome gentlemen. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Ryan, to commence the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And thank you everyone for your time today and your interest. Um, we're going to accomplish two goals today with this presentation. The first one is to give an overview of immersive simulation training in the United States. And the second one is to introduce a training solution that Becker Support Services and Anchor Flank and Pinch have been developing um, for, this, uh, for this purpose. And I want to clarify that um, none of us currently uh, work for the US Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management. And um, uh, as we discuss uh, the state of training, uh, we'll be giving our experience and perspectives, um, as well as um, the uh, knowledge that we have from our ongoing relationships um, with the agencies. Uh, but this presentation is not a presentation um, of the US Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management. Next slide. Okay. And uh, uh, like Commissioner Millington said, I'm Ryan Becker. I spent uh, 20 years uh, with the US Forest Service in the National Technology and Development Program, uh, working with the Air Tanker Qualification Program. Two years ago, um, I pursued uh, uh, private industry and um, have been involved in aerial intelligence, uh, imagery, and aerial mapping, and integrating payloads for intelligence purposes. And uh, my name is Trevor Maynard. I'm a fire protection engineer. I've split my career kind of between wildland fire and structural fire. Uh, primarily have worked in fire science and fire investigation. I spent 10 years with the U.S. government, first with the U.S. Forest Service uh, and then with the 
uh, U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, where I worked with uh, arson and explosives investigation. Um, and as of last year, I uh, left the government to um, kind of team up with Ryan and this group and try to uh, help push wildland fire technology forward. Uh, hello, uh, Kenneth Perry here. Um, everything's pretty accurate. I am uh, now working again as a retiree, uh, doing aerial mapping and intelligence gathering uh, in Southern California at this point. My background uh, obviously was ground-based uh, up until I became an aerial supervisor with hot shots and, uh, and smoke jumpers with uh, both the Forest Service and the BLM. And I'm glad to be here. Good morning, I'm Joel Lane. And uh, Ed and Ryan both uh, alluded to, I, I spent about 40 years uh, with the US Forest Service, about half on the ground, half in the air and now work for Orange County Fire Authority, uh, doing intelligence, remote sensing, mapping, as well as a quick reaction force helicopter program, day and night, 24 hour, uh, supporting uh, large helicopter programs. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be with you guys today. Thank you. The next slide. Okay, so real quick, uh, just to kind of give you a, an, an overview of where aerial firefighting has come from in the United States. Um, we go back to about, uh, you know, the 1918, 1919 timeframe, the very beginning of World War I. And we were already at that point, the Forest Service was, was looking at aircraft as a way to mitigate uh, the effects of the two, or ex, excuse me, the 1910 fire season in the Northern Rockies region. The idea being not necessarily use aircraft to suppress fire, uh, but to find them and then to be able to get forces there quickly so that we could uh, maintain uh, our mandate of getting fires out by the next morning. Uh, a little bit later on, um, in the, in the early 30s, we started trying to do firefighting with aircraft, with uh, delivery of uh, smoke jumpers for one thing, and then also water, chemicals, uh, these types of things. The early the early times were 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 biplanes, were crop duster type airplanes, with which literally they would drop bags of water out of the airplane cockpit. Um, they tried barrels of water. And then ultimately, in the late 40s and early 50s, the Forest Service and the U.S. Air Force teamed up to test dropping bombs on forest fires. Uh, they were uh, fuel tanks, external fuel tanks that would be dropped by P-40 Warhawks and the B-29 Super Fortress. Um, obviously problematic dropping heavy items from airplanes if there's firefighters on the ground. And those things never happened. Later on, we started getting out of World War II where uh, surplus airplanes were available uh, for people to buy. And that's really where the aerial suppression started with aircraft. Um, early single engine TBM torpedo bombers was pretty much the way that they went. F7Fs, uh, some of the twins. And it wasn't until the 70s, really, that we saw large airplanes, uh, the Douglas products and, and such like that. As they ramped up this idea, and obviously testing these ideas, we had uh, a very, very high accident rate. In the early days, it was uh, mechanical or structural failure, uh, single engine operations, uh, these types of things. Later on, it started to become more of a C-fit, um, human factors issue with overloaded airplanes that just didn't have the performance that they expected out of them. Um, and so the idea of, of training uh, beforehand and not just kind of going out with it, like, the, you know, flying with the seat of your pants was, was something that we had to start looking at uh, fairly early on. Not early enough, unfortunately. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we had to deal with uh, in the early days was communications uh, in general. Most airplanes at that time, especially crop dusters, didn't have radios in them. Um, the range of the radios was such that, that, that they just didn't work very well. 
And we had more and more aircraft operating in these fire areas. So coordination of those resources be, started to become uh, a, a problem that needed to be dealt with. Um, on the right side of your screen, though, you'll see basically a 1957 version of, of I, ICS, of, of where the air attack officer, where the air tankers uh, come into play with regard to uh, to the coordination. Next slide, please. So now we move forward to where we we just don't want to spend that much time with live flight exercises, especially in a high risk environment such as low level flight in in terrain. Um, and so we started to come up with better ways to do that. In about the early 2000s, the Forest Service built a simulator uh, room system with about nine different um, stations in there. You'll see a picture of one here shortly uh, in another, uh, on another slide. Um, and then we started using sand tables, which I think most everybody's uh, you know, familiar with both of these ideas here. Um, and then how to integrate that, what, what the difference between procedural training and tactical decision-making training is. And we'll talk about that. Next slide, please. So procedural training, um, you know, from, a, from an aviation standpoint, when we think of simulation, uh, simulator, computer-based, whether it's full motion or not, procedure training, we're talking about uh, bank angles and uh, ILS approaches and switches and where you put the landing gear down, where you actually have to manipulate the controls uh, from that standpoint. Um, the simulator in that, in that case is we can load the, the, the student or the, the, the person in the hot seat, if you will, um, with different tasks. We can make them repetitive tax, tasks so that they learn them quick, uh, more quickly. And then we're in a controlled training environment with complexity that we can decide what those are and obviously uh the cost is down from the fact that we don't have to to use flight time uh to do that um and uh and we can tailor it as we go along tactical decision making um is a little bit different in that that there's there's more ways to skin a cat i guess so Tactical decision making is there's an objective that you have to meet, and it really doesn't matter. You let the scenario play out, and and the variables introduced in there. You're not introducing them yourself necessarily. You let it play out, and then you can look back on that training or that training evolution and say, well, that's not the way that I would have done it, but it worked. And that's an important distinction between decision making and procedural training. Uh, and then the, the, the two ways here um, is the, the phase training, which would be, uh, and not to say that there's not procedures in aerial firefighting, there's scripts that we use and that sort of thing, but they're not hands-on procedures. Uh, so phase one, which is the, the crawl phase, if you will, might be these procedures, uh, the, the reading scripts, um, timing, 3D world that you're in, knowing what the environment you're in. Phase two training is more of a tactical decision uh, where your experience is allowing you to, to, to try out new things and, and, and see if they work. And then finally, phase three or the run phase would be taking what you've learned in the simulation environment into the real world environment with, with, with mitigations for risk. So live flight exercises uh, where everybody would go out uh, and, and using the same concept of simulation, but go out and do an actual live, fly, live flight exercise. And then of course, with the phase training, you can go back, you can use it for remedial training. We can go back and do uh, little mid-season check rides or whatever you wanna use with it. And Joel will explain that a little bit, uh, a little bit more as he goes along. Next slide, please. So here's just a quick video. That is the hardware that that's needed for uh, what we're really talking about here, at least from the from the tactical decision making side of things. Very, very small and compact. And this will take about 30 seconds to listen to.
Um, there are some power lines, hazards for other aircraft that are coming in. The power lines are running east to west. Um, but you would probably be able to get some ground crews in here. Um, we look for a road access. There's a road that goes to that water tower and around and up the hill, um, kind of where the head of the fire is. Unless that's the trail you were talking about. So Joel will continue on. Uh, thank you for your time. And if there's any, any, any questions at the end, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. It, so you can see in that video, that was a, uh, a contractor pilot that we had in training last year uh, in Chico, uh, a water scooper pilot. And just in that quick 30 seconds, you can see that there were, there were uh, it was just a quick size up uh, training sim with that and and out of that you can see that she was identifying hazards and also access to the fire with grand troops which is really if you think about it it's a pretty simple sim but at the same time it may not be depending on what's going on in her cockpit and and other things that uh may be around so you can quickly uh gauge and quantify where they sit and, and where they are in that in that simulation in that training may may seem simple but it might not be uh, when we do train aerial supervisors and pilots alike uh, you know we we often talk about complexity and what complexity is more importantly what it is not and we we know that complexity is not a place on a map so it's normally assumptions me assuming that you know what i know and vice versa um, and why wait to find out this gives us the ability to quickly go from uh, classroom PowerPoint lecture to actually doing live flight within the same hour, which is really, really big to, to me. Really, really, it's one of the most probably uh, advantageous things that I've, that I've seen with it. Um, you know, with any mission uh, that we do, and, and Ken talked about live flight when it is time to do live flight, but in simulation training as well. Uh, Anytime you, you stop that sim, two things, one of two things can happen. Uh, you can either have very good things that happen or things that didn't go well. Either way, those are very, very valuable. That's how you learn. That is how we, how we uh, grow and then you know, grow into that position and, and gain experience. And gaining experience in, in anything in the air with wildland firefighting uh, takes a long time. Uh, we're, we're waiting on a fire season or we're waiting for a date for that for that fire season to uh, to arrive or for that training to arrive. So when we look at high tech versus low tech, probably one of the biggest things that uh, that really gleam out and really shows very quickly in high tech is the consistency. You can see the consistency of your return on investment. And with low tech, a lot of times we get into uh, what I call trainee and trainer burnout. And we're waiting for, for time to be able to see what we've just learned, where now we can, we can do it very rapidly. Uh, in high tech, we have options. We can call audibles on the fly, and you can do that in low tech training too, but it's very, very quick to see your, your end result. Uh, in high tech, we're, we're very mobile with it. This can be, again, Ryan's going to get into how we can, uh, and, and Trevor, how we can do this, not even being in the same state, let alone country. Uh, with low tech, you're you're just you just don't have that. Um, we can adapt to other training methods, and Ken talked about this with uh, phase training. And when we use phase training again as as uh, crawl, walk, run. What I really like about high tech training is you can stop, pause, <clears throat> and you can go back and and talk about it. You can you can stop, talk about it, and then restart or even go back to where you were when the, when the issue or when the, when the uh, not problem, but say um, challenge came up with, with, a, with a student. Um, we go to the next slide. So applying lessons of the past, you know, procedure training, tactical decisions training don't mix well, even though they need to. A lot of times, Ken talked about this, where, uh, you know, that's what CRM bridges a lot of this, right? Uh, and procedure training is more task driven. There's no doubt. It, it's keeping an order of functionality. It's keeping, you know, the checklist and, and uh, 
what you're going to do next in an order. And we, we use procedural training somewhat in wildland uh, decision making, tactical decision making. But tactical decision making and tactical training to train to that is really, really experience driven. It, you're going to bring to that to that table into that cockpit what you know and then apply it. And yes, you have to train the new things. With wildland firefighting pilots, we need to train to fire behavior and fuels and and you know what the fire is going to do. With aerial supervisors, we need to train them to what they're doing in the cockpit, uh, radio procedure and and GPS procedure. So. With tactical, we, we call audibles. We can, you have the ability to do that with this. Um, again, CRM bridges a lot of that. And uh, it's very hard to measure um, low tech, getting back to low tech training, it's very, very hard to measure that where this is very instantaneous that we can, we can measure that. Uh, technology is naturally distracting. So when you get to trainers and trainees being comfortable with with what they're doing. It does take a little bit of um, having people in the right spot in the right in the room that, that have the experience to be able to run this and do this, as well as the subject matter experts. And when you, when you blend those two is when you really get a, a, a great uh, end product with it. Uh, managing scenarios to benefit the trainee. Um, no doubt you, you need to have a way that you can stay to the objective and, and then apply to that objective to get that. And are we teaching the right lessons? Sometimes no action is the best course, course of action. In this, you can really see, I think quicker and more consistently, you can see that um, where if the student trainee is learning, you can just let that go. So, you know, a negative training, probably the, the biggest thing is, you know, getting out of that is, is having consistency and, and a standard and applying that to a standard across the board. So we train and train and train. Um, you know, we do classroom, we do lecture, we do PowerPoint, and sometimes we'll do some sand table exercises. Um, and now we can integrate, we can integrate that in the same hour, in the same room with flying. And we have, we've never had that before. We just have not been able to do that before. And, and the most important thing about that is once that's over, you can go right back to it and do an after action review. The next uh, slide there. So one of the, the hallmarks of um, what we're, what we're gonna be talking about uh, for most of the rest of the, um, most of the rest of the presentation um, is a, a system um, that is is pretty reliant on virtual reality, not entirely reliant, but um, uh, when we uh, when we started the project that that we're working on now, um, we knew virtual reality had potential um, to really help here, um, but the, the the history of virtual reality was. Um, was good but not great. Um, we actually expected when we started using goggles that um, around 30% of the people who would use it wouldn't be able to, to tolerate it just based on the, the research. And um, thankfully we found um, in the year that we've been doing this with about 100 uh, people who have experienced um, the environment under goggles now, we haven't had a single person take the goggles off from, from VR sickness. So that's one thing um, that shows that we have had a real step change um, in technology. And it's rather difficult to explain um, just what virtual reality brings to the table, it's, it's, it's almost instantly understandable when you put the goggles on. And that's the type of reaction uh, that, we've, that, we've, that we've seen uh, people have. So it, it really is a key component of creating an immersive environment, um, very much visually oriented, uh, but that, that does key off everything. Uh, because one of the, uh, one of the most important um, basic skills um, of aerial firefighting and uh, wildland firefighting in general is seeing and describing um, to, to the right people. So um, what we've found is after working with quite a few different types of goggles, we highlighted a couple of, of high-end ones on this slide, but even with the lowest end of the mainstream goggles, 
um, people are, are very impressed. They can, they can really fall into that immersive factor and start to feel like they're, uh, they're really there in the, in the environment. And um, just, just recently, um, the VR technology along with networking technology has really increased the uh, viability and, um, and the performance of multiplayer environments, as you can see down there. And Trevor will talk a good bit more about that, but it is a really a key part of uh, making tactical decision training viable in this environment. Next slide. So we, we want to be pragmatic and, um, and, and avoid uh, problems, as, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and playing devil's, devil's advocate, uh, we know of uh, plenty of uh, times when technology has been introduced into the decision scenario um, environment with varying levels of success. Um, and it certainly hasn't established itself as a standard. Um, so really, why should we expect it to be different this way? It's a question we, we've continued to, to ask ourselves. And really, probably the biggest reason is that we have access to this high performance equipment, not just the goggles, but the, uh, but the, the computers that can power them now too. And just for an example, the amount of computing power available um, for, uh, for graphics in particular has been on an exponential rise for quite some time. And it doesn't seem like it's going to, uh, it's going to slow down. So pricing and performance, uh, the ratio has been, has been favorable and it continues to get more favorable. That visual experience, uh, what you can get for your, uh, for your money in, in VR um, has, uh, has continued to, to increase to the point now where um, it fades into the background. And that really is the most important part of this. Once technology gets out of the way, um, and it just creates that, that realistic virtual environment that, that multiple trainees, multiple role players can experience. And, and, and we're seeing that now. And, and um, on the other side, um, why change when, when you have something that, that is working well? Sand tables have proven themselves to be very, very useful tools. Well, we'll talk a little more about the, the additional opportunities um, that this technology opens up in a little bit. But the environment for wildland fire, the, the political environment, the public environment for wildland fire is, is quite different um, in the United States and Australia. We, we definitely all know that now. So there's both greater support for improvements, change, just managing the, you know, the new conditions um, around wildland fire, and, and also an expectation, an expectation that, that our public agencies um, and, and companies that work in this field um, will take any opportunities that arise to, to improve and to do things better. Next slide. So <clears throat> FS3D is a product ecosystem that we've developed really to try to address a lot of the topics that uh, Ryan was just talking, as well as, as Ken and Joel, um, with trying to really bring technology into uh, wildland fire training and really making it stick this time. Um, and what FS3D is, it's an interactive network-based wildland fire management training tool that allows role players and observers the opportunity to participate in uh, several different operating environments on a wildland fire. Um, I'll talk about the operating environments in just a moment. Um, but the, the platform as a whole, so we started developing this in early 2020, uh, and then we really started deploying it for training um, spring of 2021, so kind of the preseason for the, the U.S. fire season, uh, started deploying it to um, some tanker pilot groups as well as aerial supervision groups. Um, at the foundation of FS3D, so really the core of FS3D, is the, the fire modeling and fire suppression portion of it. Um, and what that fire model does is it ensures that all role players and all observers are seeing a synchronized fire that behaves kind of how you would expect it would. So it behaves in accordance with actual fire behavior principles. So it has to respond appropriately to the fuels, the terrain, the weather, and the suppression actions. And it has to appear synchronized to all observers. So if you and I are looking at the same fire, 
we should be seeing flamed in the same location. We should be seeing retarded in the same location and it should have the expected effect. <clears throat> um, the, the fire behavior, the fire spread model itself, it's a derivative of the Rothermel model. Some of you may be familiar with that. It was initially developed by the US Forest Service uh, decades ago and has since sort of propagated around the world and has been really heavily developed and strengthened as time has gone by. Um, and what's attractive about the Rother model, Rothermel model as a foundation um, is it's very fast. So it can work for real-time simulations, but at its core, it's still a physics-based fire model. Um, and it's very amenable to different sources of data. So whether you're in the US or uh, Europe or Australia, if you can get the, the input data, you can generally get that into the Rothermel model uh, and make it work for your location. Um, so for the fires that we are using, you know, they're actually, you'll, you'll see the fire on actual photorealistic terrain for a specific location and it responds to that terrain and those actual fuels. Um, now the, the fire itself, you know, of course the fire model uh, involves the fire spreading along three dimensional terrain. But when you look at a fire model output like the Rothmer model, what you get is essentially a two dimensional perimeter. So a big part of the back end of FS3D is taking that two dimensional perimeter and making it into a, a 3D living and breathing fire. Um, not just, you know, making special effects look nice, but actually making them relevant. So the flame, the flame lengths, the fire intensities, the smoke color, smoke intensity, all of those have to tie back to those fundamental fire behavior principles. Um, on the other side of it, so on suppression, you know, suppression, smoke development, um, that's those are models that we've developed in-house. Um, again, tying back to you know, fundamental physics and applied research in fire suppression, um, not only for retardant and water from aircraft, but also for ground suppression. So mechanical line construction, um, going as far as looking at things like crew production rates um, and really just trying to get as much realism into the simulator as possible. Um, and then at the end of that, having the fire model respond dynamically. So when you take a suppression action, you expect that the fire is going to respond to that. Um, and that's what the back end of FS3D does. Next slide, please. And before we get into the specific operating environments, um, I'll just talk about a couple of the other sort of global features of the system as a whole. Um, so obviously verbal radio communication is the backbone of wildland fire operations. So what we have is basically an independent application. So whatever, whichever operating your environment you're in, you can use our voice over IP application. Um, it's essentially a radio emulator. So what it does is it's talking voice over IP, just like we're talking on Zoom right now, um, but it brings it into sort of a radio operator interface. And it includes things like realistic frequencies, actual distortion uh, based on AM versus FM. Um, it gets very detailed into the actual functionality and um, principles of radios. So whether you're flying or you're observing on one of the map interfaces that we have on an iPad, you'll still have the ability to communicate, be in the loop with the radio communications. Uh, the, the system was really designed primarily to be used over the network. So just like a, a multiplayer video game over the internet, um, same principle. However, it could be used solo um, or it could be used in a group setting just on a local network. And we'll talk about some of those applications here towards the end. It was designed to be compatible for a wide array of hardware components. So for those that are participating uh, in the sim as pilots, we want them to be able to have access to various flight controls. Um, FS3D is a platform, pretty much any uh, commercially available flight controls will work with the flight simulation portion. Uh, as well, you know, VR goggles, um, Ryan mentioned that there are you know, there's probably five or six major VR goggles now um, that are, are being heavily produced and sold. And we've, we've tested pretty much all of them um, and they're all really compatible with the simulation. Um, and the last thing on this slide is like Joel mentioned, um, technology can be very distracting. So as you can imagine, we've got lots of bits and bytes flying around. Uh, we've got, you know, you've got wires. So the big part of it on our side from the user experience side is just getting the technology out of the way. Uh, we're trying to help 
help train firefighters to be better firefighters, not train them to be uh, information technology technicians. Next slide, please. So the components of FS3D, uh, it's kind of a, a three-legged stool. Um, if you saw on the first slide, we had a, an image of a, a cockpit. Um, if you look in the upper right-hand corner um, where you've got the smoke plume and the fire engine, um, that is a screenshot from the same software interface. So that is the, what we call the, essentially the flight simulation portion. Um, it accommodates flight or ground roles, uh, but it's within an existing commercial flight simulator. So we're using Lockheed Martin Prepare 3D. It's a PC-based commercial flight simulation software. Um, some of you may have seen it. It has been used in other, actually other firefighting applications as well. So anybody who is flying an airplane or who's in an airplane um, can participate directly through the flight simulation software. Um, it's essentially turnkey ready for use with the VR. Uh, but as Ryan mentioned, you don't have to use VR, but I think it, it, it just adds so much immersion to the simulation that everybody who has tried VR uh, won't go back to just using a, a monitor. <clears throat> if you look on the, the left there, so the largest thumbnail, um, this is actually a browser interface that we're still developing. So this is still part that's in development. But the idea here is for anybody who would like to have a first person view, whether they're a role player or an observer, they can participate in the simulation through just simply going to a web browser. Um, so you can see we're kind of matching, it's hard to tell, but these are the, the same scene uh, between the flight sim and uh, the browser instance. And what's really appealing about that is it just lowers the barrier to entry. So you don't have to have a flight simulator, you don't have to have flight controls, you don't have to worry about flying the airplane. So if you're not a pilot, you can just jump in um, into the browser instance. You can still ride along with somebody who is flying, um, but you can actually just very simply get into the simulation. Uh, another benefit here is this will work with web VR technology. So virtual reality goggles will work essentially the same as they do in the flight simulator. Um, the lower right corner is kind of what we call the, the command and control map. So that's another web-based two-dimensional map. Um, and what you can see here, this is an example of a fire. Uh, this is actually a, a real fire that occurred north of Los Angeles uh, about a month ago. Um, and the facilitator can use this two-dimensional map to essentially control the simulation. They can see the status of all the role players, where they are, what they're doing. They can see where the retardant drops are. Um, this gives the ability to, for a facilitator to control this, this simulation. For observers and participants, they can also have some level of control depending on what their role is. But of course, if you're, you're an observer or a role player, you're not going to be able to change things like the weather or add spot fires, um, but you can do relevant things to what your role is. Next slide, please. So from the, the proof of concept, so the early training that we did uh, this past spring, we learned a lot. Uh, it was a great experience. Um, we got lots and lots of valuable feedback. Um, I think as Ryan mentioned, we had uh, well over 100 pilots, firefighters, aerial supervisors go through some scenario-based training with FS3D. Um, the, the biggest enthusiasm we saw were really on two things. The first was just the VR technology itself. Um, a lot of people had not used VR before, so there's the kind of the, the wow factor of just being in that 3D environment. Um, and secondly, nobody had been in a, a 3D environment uh, with fire, so 3D VR environment with fire. Um, the second thing was just seeing the, the 3D fire and smoke visualization, seeing a fire respond to the train and the fuels how you would expect. Um, that was a big um big amount of positive feedback that we got. And, you know, many people stress the importance of making sure that you actually get the fire right, because without having appropriate fire behavior, it really makes it tough to have a good scenario. One challenge, so we, we worked with lots of pilots, um, both on the, the private contractor side, as well as uh, a group within the US Air Force with the MAPS program, uh, C-130 pilots. And a challenge with the pilots is there's a very broad spectrum of opinions. So um, some would like something like FS3 integrated into a very complex, you know, procedures trainer or even like a level D flight simulator. Um, for them, that would really be the pinnacle of, of firefighting simulation is to train exactly as you would operate. 
Um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, there were a number of pilots who said, you know, I've been flying for 30 years. I've got, you know, 15,000 hours of, of heavy turbine time. I don't need to learn how to fly an airplane. I want to be in this training for the fire training portion of it. So put me in a Piper Cub. Um, let me just fly kind of low and slow around the fire, but let me talk with the area to air attack or that aerial supervisor. So let me talk with this, uh, this guy or girl that's been doing this job in the fire service for 30 years and have them explain to me why I'm doing, you know, what I'm doing. Why are you asking me to drop retardant here? Why are you asking me to take these tactics? Um, and that's actually, a, it's a two-way street. So uh, conversely, you know, we have the opportunity to let the air attack ride along with the tanker pilot or ride along with a helicopter pilot um, and get an idea of what it's like for them, you know. They, they may be only at a thousand feet below, but it's a very different environment than, than what the air attack might be operating in. So it really offers a, an opportunity for kind of cross-pollination of roles. Um, people can jump into a different role and, and get an understanding of what that job is like um, in a, a safe and inexpensive environment. <clears throat> I think the, the last, kind of the last big takeaway for us from the proof of concept, um, from the, the early training we did, is you know the technology is great. Everybody's you know it, anybody who's ever put on a pair of VR goggles, it is hard to take them off. It's a lot of fun, um, but without expert facilitation, um, the tech you know it mostly just becomes a video game. Um, if you're just there, you know, flying around by yourself, can you learn something from it? Absolutely, you can learn something, um, but without having an expert feedback. Um, it really makes it tough to take away, you know, specific, um, really specific bullet points that you can take away and take back to your job. So regardless of how good the technology is, we can never, you know, cut the cord of the facilitator. So having that experience, whether it's a tanker pilot, an aerial supervisor, ground firefighter, having somebody there that can facilitate, that's done the job, that knows what, number one, how to decide what the objective should be. And number two, how to monitor how the simulation is going. Um, without that, you know, really good technology can end up on the shelf um, because people aren't able to get their, their use out of it. Next slide, please. So the excitement that the training community had while we were doing the proof of concept was very encouraging. Um, but the part that, that was, um, uh, most gratifying, I think, for us was the ideas of what we could do or what, what trainers could do with, the, with this technology um, was what really showed there's, there's, there's a bright future to what we're doing here. And uh, one key part of that um, that I think this enables beyond what's really possible with a, with a sand table um, and other more, more static types of, of situations um, is that uh, we really do the open up the opportunity um, to simulate more of real incidents. Um, let those continue in a way that's a little more difficult to do with, with lower tech um, decision uh, training um, systems. So uh, that's, that's one big part um, that we think is, is going to move along fairly well. That, that uh, example of a large uh, or a, uh, of a recent fire um, earlier on in the, in the presentation is one where we're starting to explore uh, the possibilities for uh, actually reconstructing real incidents um, and using those for after action reviews. Um, that, that could be a um, uh, something that, that, that has a lot of, um, uh, a lot of support. Um, and this really does give the, the ability to tweak things until you, until you get it just, until you get it just right. Um, and it, and it comes back through in a very realistic way. The, the other part of this that, um, will really open up the, the possibilities is, is getting more people um, using the technology. And um, that, uh, the, the, the fact is not many people, and we saw it, not many people have used VR goggles in the first place. Um, and even fewer people have um, experienced a, a fire in those. And um, what we would love to see, um, because there is, uh, there is plenty of, of uh, work going on, some research 
uh, and implementation with other types of systems is um, the, the customers that are investigating this, who have made the investments, um, it would be great to see some, some standards um, and, and, and thoughts to interoperability uh, because that really opens up those potential uh, use cases, um, particularly um, with multi-agency situations um, and multidisciplinary training as well, uh, bringing ground firefighters into the um, into the mix um, in in these in these scenarios, not just to be role players, but to actually play that play that part um, and and practice the maybe book learning that they've had for um, for aerial firefighting. And Joel has a couple of uh, closing thoughts on the on the future as well. Yeah, we. Uh... Ryan, it, what you just alluded to, and, and I think Ken and both Trevor mentioned it too, is, is those other roles being, being able to, uh, you may not be training those other people or entities into those roles, but they can at least uh, view it and experience it. And that in itself will give them a better idea. You know, we do a lot uh, in our National Aviation Academy down, down south uh, that I was a part of, Ken it was a part of for years. And that's exactly what we do. If you want to have somebody... Um, you know, feel what, what it's like, and then, you know, gain further, some, some further knowledge of that is to put them into that role. One of the things that we were looking at and uh, that I really want to experience with it is with incident within an incident uh, training with this. And uh, Ken and I did some of that, uh, actually a lot of it, uh, about a decade of it. And there's some in the audience, uh, in this audience that were, were part of that as well. And so you can easily adapt that into this. Um, the, the other, you know, in the future, we, we, we talk about the investment of a, of a student, of a trainee, and then also the maintenance of that, of that student, that trainee, you know, when you start getting into aerial supervision, plays a huge role uh, of cost trying to do that. And when you have somebody that hasn't kept up with that um, or is maybe struggling with that, I think this is another way that you can then uh, very, very, uh, economically get them back into that um can train anytime that is the that's probably the biggest thing that i see here you don't have to wait for that calendar on the date to, to do training we can train year round and i've always been a huge proponent of training in the season or in other words we should be doing training uh while we're actually fighting fire and you can come back and and as uh ryan just talked about we can relive older fires past fires <clears throat> and we can actually have lessons learned fresh on the table that day. Thanks, Rob. Hey, Creek, I see Air Attack Zero Echo Tango on the ground. Air Attack Zero Echo Tango, Day Creek, I see. Just got to the fire here, top of Day Creek Boulevard at the trailhead. What's your position? Air Attack, uh, we're just passing over the 15 freeway right now. We've got the fire in sight. So we'll be over here in just a second, and we'll go ahead and take a lap uh, if you want to give me your priorities. Yeah, copy that, uh, air attack. This is moving pretty good right now. It just crossed a uh, power line access road. we got uh, power lines running east to west along here. Moving south, uh, pretty good. I expected to have some municipal engines coming up, but uh, they called in, reported a uh, vehicle accident blocking their, their access right now. This is developing pretty quickly here, probably 15 to 20 foot flame links on the head uh, moving west. I have, I have no eyes on the north, so if you can let me know about that and then uh, what air resources we might have to buy us some time while the municipal engines get in. Yeah, air attack copies. Uh, Tanker 160 is just behind us off of San Bernardino. He should be on about a 10 minute ETA. Uh, looks like that might be the only fixed wing we get for a little while. So if you can let me know your priorities for him, because he's going to be here pretty quick. Okay, I'm going to order uh, whatever helicopters I can get as well, see if we can get them in as, as quick as possible. Biggest priority is this. Uh, left flank on the on the south end looks like uh, there's potential to impact the uh the neighborhood at the top of day creek here all right there's that copies we're just swinging around the uh western edge around the head of the fire here so we're gonna come back and take a look what's your location 
I am at the trailhead at uh, the top of Day Creek, um, right next to a, uh, a water tower. There's a kind of a line of water towers running east to west along here. Yeah, copy that. The head of the fire is starting to make a pretty good run towards that closest uh, water tank there. Yeah, I got you, air attack. Uh, I'm considering pulling back south here pretty soon just to uh, give myself a little extra space. And air attack, Day Creek IC on air to ground. Cobra air attack. Yeah, dispatch says they've got uh, helicopter 531 and 40 Echo en route from San Bernardino. Uh, I think we're going to try and get them on the, uh, on the left flank on the south to cool things down and protect those, uh, those neighborhoods. So when Tanker 160 comes in, let me know what it looks like on the on the north side and whether there are any options for going after the head on this as well. Air attack copies. Day Creek IC air attack. Go for IC. It sounds like Tanker 160 had to return to San Bernardino for mechanical. So we may be down at fixed wing for a while. There's nobody else available at the moment. Okay, I copy that. I have diverted the municipal engines to initiate evacuations. We have Sheriff's Department assisting with that in the neighborhood. Anything we can do to buy us time on that is my priority right now. If you can uh, talk to those helicopters as they, uh, as they come inbound and let me know uh, what options we have on that. Copy that. We'll be on the lookout for the helicopters. And just FYI, uh, when this thing gets across to the other side of the trailhead, you got some pretty, uh, you got heavier fuels on that side. So I think once it crosses the trail, it is going to pick up quite a bit. It looks like you're probably only three, four minutes from it crossing the trail by the water tank. Okay, I see copies that. And um, could use an update on the north side as well. Apparently there was a 911 call with uh, hikers up the up the canyon, getting worried about exit with the uh, fire and smoke to the to the north. Could you give me an update on that? Yeah, the the north or the the right flank it, it is picking up a little bit. It's it hasn't changed a whole lot in the last five ten minutes, but uh, once it gets into those heavier fuels, it is going to move pretty good. Uh, it looks like you've got so the, the you got the main trail and then there may be one other egress. Looks like a little road or trail to the to the west, but I think that's going to be impacted probably within the next 20 minutes. There's no no obvious egress for anyone headed this way. Both of those are right in the path of the fires. So I don't know if you can get the helicopter or something up there for them because I don't think they're going to be able to get out this way. Okay, I see copies. Break helicopter 531 Day Creek IC on air to ground. Helicopter 531, Day Creek IC on air to ground. Air Tag Zero Echo Tango, Day Creek IC on air to ground. Go for air attack. Yeah, are there any other tankers available? I'd like to place an order for all available resources. We have uh, immediate threat to life and property here. Yeah, it doesn't look great right now. We've got a couple, we've got a bunch of tankers on a no diaper up north a little bit. We'll check in again. Uh, I don't expect we're going to get anything within the next hour. I see copies. Day Creek, I see air attack. Go for IC. Yeah, the, the head of the fire is picking up speed pretty good. It's, it's past the water tank now. You probably see it there. 
and it is well established on the left flank to the south of the, the main dirt road there. And it is starting to march towards the subdivision pretty good. It's probably picked up 10 acres just in the last couple minutes here. So if you've got any resources in that area, especially in that northeast corner of the subdivision, I go check on that because it's, it's moving that way pretty good. Okay, copy that. Day Creek Air Attack, I see on air to ground. Go Bear Attack. Yeah, just a status update. Uh, the municipal engines are prepping structures in the uh, subdivision right now. Evacuations are complete, and we're looking at working contingency on the left flank to uh, prevent this from crossing the next east-west road on the south. Yeah, copy that. It's uh. The flank hasn't moved, the left flank hasn't moved a lot to the south. It mostly is just the head of the fire marching towards that northeast corner of this northernmost subdivision. It is gonna, it looks like it's gonna impact kind of right on the corner, so it, it may miss it, but right now it looks like it's pretty much directly in the path, kind of where the, you know, the flank and the head meet. On the north end, it is starting to move into the heavier fuels, so I imagine you're gonna start to get uh, some pretty good, good fire growth on that side as well. Okay, the smoke has really filled things in. I have no eyes on the head of the fire right now. Conditions here, the wind is picking up from the east, becoming more concerned about spotting. Thanks, Ryan and uh, Trevor, Joel, and, and Ken for your uh, presentations uh, today. Um, obviously, we're very interested in the work you've been doing in the United States, particularly around the University of Simulation Training for Wildland Fire. Um, agencies here in Australia uh, have been do doing a lot of work to develop this capability and I'm sure your insights will certainly assist a number of people um, in that regard. Um, I know there's been a couple of questions that have come through uh, from our audience in, in the Q&A uh, boxes and I think Kenneth and, and Joel have uh, answered some of those uh, accordingly, um, but there's also a couple that have come in uh, through other means and if I may, uh, to any of you, um, there's a question there, how can you quantify the return on investment with high-tech training? Not sure who wants to answer that one for me. Joel, you have some, some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. And you can, you know, again, why wait to see um, what you're gonna get out of a student or a trainee, both pilot and aerial supervisor, after you've invested tra time travel, um, and, and a place that, that you're going to uh, host this training. I, I think quantifying that investment uh, can be done in the same day uh, as they're getting the training now. You don't have to wait. They, they, go, they go to training one month and two months later, they're now using that training. Um, here, you can actually do that. You can, you can have classroom lecture, PowerPoint, and you can go right into a simulation and once that's over, you can actually see the performance firsthand on that day. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, aspects of, of actually capturing that of your, of your return on investment. Great, great question, thank you. Thanks, Joel. Um, there's a question there from Ivan Perkins. Do you find that CRM increases or decreases with the use of VR goggles? Who would like to answer that one for me? Yeah, so um, the, the, the problem with the, the goggles as it stands right now, and I, I think, you know, Ryan being the tech and, and, and uh, Trevor being the tech guys looking into the future, I think that's going to change. But right now, that's why this, this part of it, we can do procedural training or CRM training. Let's not say procedural, but uh, we can do that on a desktop version. We're just not going to get as immersed in uh in the goggles in that 3d environment so what we would do as, a, as an idea would be to set up uh stations for vr and then one station with one of those big curved streams with the cockpit with dual um 
uh, dual instruments, et cetera, that you can run checklists through. And then also, I think the biggest thing and one of the questions I saw was, how do you look over at the other person and give them a thumbs up if you can't see them? So that's why you would use the desktop version or uh, a box, and then you could do that with it. Thank you. Um, just before we go to the next question, there's a, a question there from Danny and Greg. I'm not sure in the background if you're able to get it ready, but they've just asked if we could run the video presentation that uh, uh, was being uh, prepared at the end. I know we were coming to questions, but I'll just see if you're able to do that. Um, but in the meantime, Ryan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, the, the, just wanted to add to the question about uh, about CRM. Um, and uh, like we mentioned, we, we are still in development on um, on FS3D. And one of the capabilities that is um, coming along um, quite rapidly in VR technology is actually um, mixed reality. And um, there are solutions out there now, even commercial solutions um, that do provide for the, the real life um, to pass through and be, and be overlaid in the VR view. Um, they are quite expensive at the moment. Um, the, the, the highest end goggle that, uh, that we showed in the, in the presentation is uh, from a, a company named Vario. And um, a, another company just recently received a ASA certification of a, of a trainer, and it's based in mixed reality. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a, there is a link uh, in the chat uh, to Vario's home uh, homepage, I believe. Um, you should be able to, to navigate to a press release about that to give you some idea of, of what the future can hold um, with technology as a potential solution to that as well. Great, thanks, Ron. Um, there's a question there from Will, just wondering what version of uh, P3D, FS3D is currently capable with? Does it provide for recording of the sim session for future playback? Yeah, Trevor, do you want to cover that one? Yeah, so we are currently using uh, version four of Prepare 3D. Um, it will work with version five. Uh, we're stable on version four, but version five is out there. Um, and I think to, to extend this question a little bit, um, there are other flight simulation platforms out there. Uh, the, the main two are X-Plane and then Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. Um, those platforms could also be a possibility. Uh, Prepare 3D has met our needs so far uh, with the platform that it has, um, but the, the, the FS3D platform as a whole it could be ported to another flight simulator as well. Um, and so I'm sorry, the second part of the question, um, yes, a big part of it is recording the sim sessions um, and firstly through just live streaming as well as just recording for, for future playback. Correct. Um, Quickly from Cameron, are you able to simulate various radio traffic or background noises that are usually found over a fire in the radio messages made by players? Yeah, with the voice over IP radio system, um, one of the features of that is to be able to pipe in um, air traffic control noise as well as aircraft sound. Um, you can also add um, you know, fire radio traffic um, just as background noise as well if, if that's a desire. Right. Um, and from Wayne down in Victoria, thanks. Uh, what's your opinion on the balance between simulation time and actual flying time in the air training for the role? Um, does the flying time remain the same uh, as the previous training courses and that sim helps better prepare students for the flying aspect? So I'd be very interested in uh, Ken or, or Joel and, and Esri, your thoughts on, on that one? Yeah, what I, it seems like to me and, and you know, I would say probably um, it's probably with this type of technology, I would say 25% of all the total training, maybe, maybe even less than that would be, would be real flight time. And the best way to do that is in that crawl, walk, run, that if you do CRM training on a computer, you immediately go out and do CRM in an airplane and then you come back and then you start doing the other things and then go back out there. The final big holy moly test would be real flight at the very end. Uh -huh. I, I might add that exactly what Ken just said, but you can, you can test that, you know, many, many times before you go out and actually do that. The other thing is the qualification uh, 
tool of what that takes. We use a task book, which is called a task book. And it has, uh, you know, pages of elements, 114 different elements. It has to be, it has to be tasked. And we've looked at that. We've looked at actually what, what can be accomplished in that task book uh, through using uh, VRSAM FS3D. And, and there's, it's, it, there, there's a lot that can be accomplished. Cool. So I think that's all we have in terms of, of the questions. And I think we're just approaching the end. Uh, we did have a question there, will the links that uh, have been shared in the chat boxes be shared with the presentation? I can confirm um, they will be shared uh, with the presentation recording once they're uh, emailed out. So look, on, on that note, as we approach uh, midday here in Australia, um, I'm pleased to say uh, this has turned into a, an international event. We've got guests here, not just from Australia, but also Canada and the US as participants. So uh, on behalf of, of uh, NAFSI and AFAC, I'd just like to thank Ryan, Trevor, Joel and Kenneth for making the time to speak with us today. It's certainly provided us with a lot to think about and, and we're very you know, excited to see how you continue to develop that capability and what we can learn here in Australia. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, AFAC and NAFSI team for facilitating the session, in particular, Nicola Lawrence, Greg Taylor and, and Charlotte Fell. Uh, and obviously thank everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, when you do exit today's Zoom session, you'll be asked to complete a short survey. Um, the NAFSI team will use this information to ensure our professional development events, such as this webinar, continue to meet your needs. Um, it's been my pleasure to host you today. I hope you found the webinar very valuable. And again, to our, our four guests, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your evening, stay safe, and farewell to next time. Thank you. Thanks everyone. That is awesome. Oh, thank you, Greg. That went great. Yeah, that was that was terrific, guys. Thank you. And what we'll do is when we have um, the team edit the video, we'll get them to plug that um, that 10 minutes in there as well. So that'll be in there for them. Awesome. Perfect. Thank right. you. No, I think that ran pretty well <laughs> that was great yeah uh, hey are are, are are our emails going to be on something that goes out so people can ask questions you know offline obviously we or are they going to go they're going to go to you ryan probably to your uh company email uh i think if they're re re uh, related to the webinar specifically is there um is there a correspondence uh, through AFAC? We, yeah. we can invite people to contact us and we can forward any questions onto you that way rather than give out your direct if you if that would be what your preference is. Oh, I'm I'm perfectly happy to to have you give out the the direct. Um, and the all the the pages that we control that uh, that were linked in there, they could get to to that. But if I figured if they if they are using the, the direct links from the webinar, then um, yeah, that would be perfectly fine uh, for you to forward them on or just provide uh, my email address um, in there if, if that works too. All right, so what we'll do is we generally send an email out to everyone who registered for the event once the recording's available and we'll include those um, links that we put into the chat because everyone was quite interested in those. Um, so what we'll also do is just include a, you know, um, contact the speaker button in there as well. So when they click on that, it'll email you.
Great. Cool. That works for me. Perfect. Very good. Well, thanks again, Kenneth and Ryan. And I, I think the others have dropped off by the look of it. But yeah, I think um, uh, that everyone found that valuable. We're just sort of starting to enter this field. We've got some varying and limited capabilities and we're, we're certainly looking to develop it. The RFS, my agency has, has uh, bought and we're just establishing a, a center of excellence. We've been given some money to build a, a dedicated facility for this purpose. So we certainly find it very informative and I, I dare say some of my team will reach out to you uh, in due course. So look, thank you so much again and, and Nicola and, and Greg and Charlotte, thanks for pulling it together. It's uh, been a, another great webinar. I, I, I like this group. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. We'll see you guys uh, later. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye. Right. Bye. 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 Thank you. That was good. Thanks, Ben. Much appreciated. I these. I get so nervous. You did great. You would never have known. No worries. Thank you. All right. See you later. Thank you.